When we left off, Donenfeld and Leibowitz had gained control of national publications and detective comics, squeezing out uh, Major Wheeler Nicholson, and had then <clears throat> entered into a deal with Maxwell Gaines, who was wanting to launch uh, his, his own company, All American Comics, which uh, Donenfeld financed, but with the understanding that Leibowitz would be a junior partner uh, with Gaines. Okay? Well, uh, this puts Leibowitz now in charge of the major's former uh, comic book operations. Obviously, Donenfeld isn't going to be in charge. So, uh, Leibowitz is the top guy at National Slash Detective. And he came up, uh, proposed the idea, I don't know that he originally proposed it, but he was behind it, uh, of a fourth title. One that uh, was uh, geared as closely as possible to the popular tastes of their readership, which mostly was adolescent, pre-adolescent boys. And Leibowitz decided the ideal title would be action comics because, you know, kids like lots of action, right? Uh, so that's going to be the title, but what's going to be in it is the question. Now, I had mentioned that Gaines had been working with Dell Publishing in uh, you know, putting out famous funnies, and then uh, Dell Magazines had started having some other comic strip reprint comics. He had also uh, gotten work at the McClure Syndicate, which is one of several uh, newspaper syndicates that syndicated comic strips. And that is where this guy is going to come into the story. Sheldon Meyer, who at this point was just about 21 years old. Meyer had started working at uh, Fleischer Animation Studios when he was just 17, and he had been in on the ground floor with the major with uh, New Fun slash More Fun Comics. Meyer was both a writer and an artist. He was the, he was the, the whole package. Uh, so he had had uh, several things in... Uh, the Major's uh, publications, and he had been working for Dell doing covers for their uh, comic, uh, comic strip reprint comics. And he had gotten on uh, also at McClure Syndication as an editor working under the supervision of Max Gaines. And uh, one of uh, Meyer's responsibilities was to uh, go through the, uh, the submissions pile uh, of uh, comic strips that were being pitched to, this, to the syndicate, right? To try to look for uh, promising writers and artists and promising uh, comic strip ideas. And he had started, uh, well, for some time, he had been receiving stuff from these two guys. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Now, we've talked about them before. They were uh, a, uh, a writer-artist team that had gotten work uh, on the ground floor with the Majors' uh, New Fun Comics. They had had uh, several series going on there. Henri Duvall, The Musketeer, uh, Dr. Occult, they had one called just uh, Spy, and uh, in uh, 1937 they had a new, uh, new character, a new series that appeared in Detective Comics number one, Slam Bradley, who was uh, a rough and tumble, two-fisted action hero, private detective. But uh, none of those, none of those things were their true passion. Their true passion was this character and concept that they had been uh, tinkering with and modifying, really since they had met in high school, uh, a character called 
Superman. Right out of high school, Siegel and Schuster had started submitting stories to the science fiction pulp magazines. Now, these were not comic strips. They were prose short stories written by Siegel with accompanying illustrations by Schuster. Uh, and they hadn't gotten anywhere uh, with that. They hadn't gotten anything accepted. So they, uh, they decided to do their own magazine um, that they uh, mimeographed copies of and sold. Uh, they did about five issues in 1932-33. Uh, uh, and one of them that came out in January of 1933 was called The Reign of the Superman. The name of their publication, by the way, which was the sort of thing that would... Uh, become known as a fanzine, right? It's not uh, professionally done, but put together by fans. The name of it was Science Fiction, The Advance Guard of Future Civilization. And the, uh, the story, The Reign of the Superman, was in issue three out of, I think, five that they did. Now, they did not come up with the term Superman. That had come into common usage. In the late 19th century, the, the term was introduced, actually in, in German, by philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche uh, as the uh, Ubermensch, uh, translated into English as Superman. There had been a play about 20 years before this by George Bernard Shaw called Man and Superman. So uh, you know, the term, like I said, had come into common usage. Tarzan sometimes was referred to by Edgar Rice Burroughs as a Superman. Usually, the idea connoted uh, a, uh, a man developed to the maximum human potential. Well, uh, Siegel uh, envisioned his Superman, their Superman, as something even beyond the maximum normal human potential, uh, one step beyond, as it were. And so this short story featured the Superman uh, who was a villain, an insidious, megalomaniacal villain with psychic powers. Um, a little bit after this, uh, this fanzine story first appeared, though, uh, Siegel got uh, a, a bit of an inspiration You see, Jerry Siegel bought a copy of Detective Dan, which came out, of course, in May 1933. Uh, he bought a copy of it and read it, and his, uh, his moment of inspiration was, well, two things. Number one, the villainous Superman character could be a hero. And not only that, uh, it could be a comics hero. Um, so he got together with, uh, with his friend uh, Joe and they sent a proposal to Consolidated Book Publishing. Actually, they did more than send a proposal. They actually worked up an entire comic book issue called The Superman. And they submitted it to Consolidated, uh, which is the company that had published Detective Dan. They got back an encouraging letter. Hey, guys, this is good stuff. Uh, but uh, they weren't planning on publishing any more comic books. Uh, so that was a, a quite a disappointment. Such a disappointment that uh, Joe Schuster, uh, in, in frustration, burned the book, burned the pages. And uh, the only thing that we have is the, uh, the cover, which you can see here, because uh, Jerry Siegel was able to grab that out of the fire. Well, there's not a whole lot of, uh, in you know, late 1933, not a lot of options as far as comic books go, because, again, this was still a developing art form. That famous funny stuff is just going on you know, around this time. Uh, so, they take the concept, and Jerry and Joe, literally, 
go back to the drawing board. They decided to try to get Superman published as a comic strip, uh, as a newspaper strip, which again, if you could get on with the major syndicates, uh, that could be very good money for writers and artists, certainly compared to uh, uh, comic books, this, this newer, newer art form. So they worked up some samples and they started submitting them to all the different newspaper syndicates and they were turned down over and over and over again for about four or five years. Um, the general consensus seemed to be that the story was too outlandish, too unbelievable, too much like fantasy. Nobody would uh, believe it. Nobody would buy it. And uh, none of the people at the various newspaper syndicates were buying it either. But there was one exception, and that was Sheldon Meyer, who was working for uh, McClure Syndicate. Um, Sheldon Meyer liked the idea. Uh, in fact, it appealed to him greatly. Uh, it kind of reminded him of the Scarlet Pimpernel or, or Zorro, this idea of having a, an alter ego, uh, a secret identity that was completely different from the heroic identity. And so, uh, so he liked it, and, and he wanted to buy it, but he, he didn't get to make the final decision. He had to take, take that idea and pitch it upstairs, and he kept getting turned down over and over and over again. In fact, he said that uh, uh, he had pitched Siegel and Schuster's Superman idea to his bosses at McClure, which included Maxwell Gaines, 15 times, only to be turned down. And uh, he kept trying. Uh, he kept trying. He kept going to Gaines and uh, trying to convince him just what a great idea that this was and how well it would go over, particularly with kids. And finally, on one of the occasions when he uh, took the idea back to Gaines yet again, and this was in early 1938, uh, Gaines uh, informed him that, hey, you know, um, uh, Donenfeld and Leibowitz uh, are going to be putting out a, a fourth title, um, and they're looking for material. In fact, they're kind of desperate for material because it was a quick turnaround. Leibowitz wanted this Action Comics number one uh, put out as quickly as possible. And so... Uh, they, uh, they had some material in their submissions pile they hadn't used for other stuff, but they needed something new. Gaines contacted Leibowitz, and uh, they set up a meeting between Sheldon Meyer and Vin Sullivan, whom Leibowitz had hired to be the editor for the new title, Action Comics. So uh, Sheldon Meyer came... Uh, loaded for bear to to defend this idea of, of Siegel and Schuster's. And uh, it didn't hurt that Leibowitz and Sullivan were desperate for material because they were trying to get this thing out uh, as quickly as possible, um, in part because they were hoping to make a splash, you know, probably and recoup some of the, the losses that the, uh, the major had had. Um, so anyway... Uh, it was decided that uh, they would give this a try. They would give Superman a try. So they contacted Siegel and Schuster and uh, told them that they would take the sample comic strips that they had put together uh, if they would make some uh, slight revisions, change them around a little bit, uh, and they would run that as the lead feature in Action Comics number one. Now remember... Superman was Siegel and Schuster's crown jewel. It was their big hope, this thing that uh, they, uh, they dreamed would get them into newspaper syndication, right? Which is where the money was and where the recognition was. Cartoonists who worked for newspapers had a certain degree of respectability, uh, 
uh, among the general uh, population, whereas people who worked by these fly-by-night comic book companies were often regarded as little better than hoodlums. So that had been their big dream, to get into the newspapers, and they had been trying for five years with no success. At any time, they could have taken this Superman idea uh, and tried to get it into comic books, right? Because they were, they were doing lots of work for, uh, for the major at uh, national publications and uh, later detective comics. But they didn't do that. They didn't want to use up their best chance to take their biggest shot too early uh, and settle for less than what they dreamed of getting. Um, however, like I said, it had been years, and it was very discouraging. Plus, essentially, um, they, they had the opportunity to be on the front cover of this comic, which uh, none of their characters had really uh, had that kind of exposure before. So potentially... Potentially, that could take them another step in the right direction toward getting uh, recognition uh, and toward having a shot at getting accepted by the newspapers. So uh, they took the deal, and the deal was the standard rate that um, National offered of $10 per page to be shared between the two of them. Uh, and they, they reworked their uh, comic strips, and it was a 13-page uh, introductory story. So it wasn't the entire issue. There were more than half a dozen different stories in the comic. Uh, theirs was $13, so they got 130 bucks to split between them, and they got the front cover. Which, by the way, Harry Donenfeld wasn't happy about at all when he found out. Uh, because he thought the character was ridiculous. He essentially said, not in so many words, but uh, uh, in fact, he may have used harsher words, uh, what the heck is this crap? Uh, this, is, this is insane. This looks silly. Uh, you'd better never have this garbage character on the cover of one of our magazines again. That is, until the sales figures came in. The 200,000 copy print run of Action Comics number one sold out almost immediately and subsequent issues did just as well. Within a few months they were selling a million copies per issue which uh, was unprecedented incredibly unprecedented success for any comic book any single issue of a comic book uh, Siegel and Schuster, meanwhile, had their dream come true because about six months later, not only were they continuing to script uh, the uh, adventures of Superman in action comics, but uh, through, the, uh, through the aegis of uh, national uh, allied publications, uh, they got on at uh, the McClure Syndicate with a Superman comic strip. That was soon appearing in hundreds of newspapers around the country. Now, I spent uh, quite a bit of time earlier setting up some context for the 1930s and 40s and, and comic books, uh, particularly uh, as relating to Jewish immigration to the United States and the, uh, the effect that that would have on the first uh, generation of comic book creators and the characters that, that they created. There's, there's been a lot written about this, several very good books. Um, probably not the best book, but a pretty good one. Certainly the best title uh, is one uh, called Up, Up, and Oy Vey by a rabbi named uh, Simcha Weinstein. Anyway... Let's take a look at uh, Superman and see how, how this theme fits in. Okay, so you're familiar with the story, I'm sure, of the origin of, of Superman, uh, whose real name was Kal-El. And Kal-El was a little infant uh, 
who was saved from destruction when his family placed him on this vessel and sent him out into space, not knowing where he would end up, only knowing he would be destroyed if he remained where he was. So they placed all their hopes uh, for his future in him in this vessel, and it eventually was discovered by some kind people from uh, on another planet, another race, another culture, uh, and uh, they they adopted him and raised him as their own, and he had a new name, Clark Kent. And uh, his his secret was uh, was not revealed to the world at large. Uh, the secret of who he uh, who and what he really was. However, there was this strong feeling that he had a special destiny, a special destiny to uh, to save people. Uh, and he adopted this new culture and sort of lived within it and took advantage of it, but never uh, revealing his, uh, his true nature during his childhood. All right, well, does this sound at all like any other story that you may have heard? Uh, of course, the, the story of Moses is what I'm referring to, who was uh, saved when his, uh, his mother put him in a basket and sent him out on the river because all the children were being killed. And he was discovered by an Egyptian princess and raised up as an Egyptian until in his adulthood uh, he sort of fulfilled his destiny by being a tool of God, right? So, that's familiar. Do you know what else the Superman story kind of sounds like? Kind of sounds like the experience of those Jewish immigrants who had to flee, particularly uh, the fact that many of them were little children. Um, Harry Donenfeld, uh, for example, that we've talked about. Uh, Maxwell Gaines, as little children, uh, had to flee their place of, of origin. Some of the others, Siegel and, and Schuster, and so forth, were born shortly after their parents had to flee, and they had to come to this entirely new place where they had to assume new identities, sometimes literally assuming new identities by changing their names, right? Like uh, uh, Yaakov Leibowitz becoming Jack or, or Jacob, or uh, like, uh, well, perhaps... One that you've heard of is uh, a guy named Stanley Lieber, who uh, changed his name professionally to Stan Lee because he sounded too Jewish. So that Jewishness, that alienness, had to be kept hidden. However, there was still this strong feeling of not only being victims of oppression and therefore having a deep sense of understanding for other people who were being downtrodden, but also a sense of righteousness, uh, a sense of a mission to not only set their people free, you know, like, like Moses, but to set all people free. Um, and that ties in a little bit with, uh, actually quite a bit, with the early stories of Superman, and as we'll see later, some of the other superheroes that followed in his wake. You see, for that first year or two, Superman didn't fight any supervillains and uh, didn't fight any monsters or aliens from outer space. Instead, he fought domestic abusers and gangsters and corrupt politicians and corrupt businessmen who uh, were taking advantage of the people. So in a lot of ways, that uh, early Superman was a reflection of the FDR New Deal values of a lot of Jewish Americans uh, in particular at that time. 
Now, Harry Donenfeld might not have uh, uh, have sort of been in tune with that particular uh, uh, philosophy, and he might not have understood the attraction of this uh, fantasy figure, this uh, uh, thing that had seemed so so silly. But um, one thing he did understand was money and success. He understood that um, lightning had been caught in a bottle, and he immediately started looking for ways to market this beyond just comic books. He also recognized that uh, he had been wrong, and a super-powered character in a brightly colored, weird, circus-looking uniform um, actually could be really popular. Therefore, he needed more of them. And if he was able to recognize that, so were many of his competitors. Before we see what happened next, let's step back in time a couple of years to provide some context for the next phase of the story. And we're going to start with this guy, Samuel Maxwell Iger, better known as Jerry Iger, who was uh, an artist born and raised in New York, son of uh, Jewish immigrants, who contributed several one-page uh, things to uh, Maxwell Gaines's uh, famous funnies early on. Then, in 1936, starting in uh, July with the first issue, uh, Iger uh, produced his own, his own comic book, Wow, What a Magazine, which featured a lot of reprints, such as, for example, Popeye, with some original material. Now, the comic only lasted for four issues before it went under. And what makes it significant is the fact that it was while putting out that comic book that Jerry Iger met this guy, Will Eisner, quite a bit younger than, than Iger. He was only, uh, only about 20 years old. Also, the son of Jewish immigrants, born and raised in New York City, went to DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. Uh, Will Eisner was uh, uh, also a, uh, an artist. He drew several strips for Wow What a Magazine. And if his name is familiar already just from our lectures, it's because we started off talking about Will Eisner and his book about um, comics as sequential art that came out in the 1980s. And I mentioned then that Will Eisner was one of, maybe even the, most influential comics artists of the 20th century. Anyway, these guys um, met, worked together, and when Wow! What a Magazine went under, Eisner had an idea. Okay, The idea was for the next phase, right? So um, New Fun Magazine had already come out, so there were people producing new material for comic books. Wow, what a magazine had a handful of new stuff as filler. Uh, but everyone else had been relying so far on reprints of comic strips. And the fact is, they were about to run out of comic strips to reprint and get the rights to. So the future was definitely going to be with original material. So Eisner proposed that uh, Iger's know-how and Eisner's artistic and writing ability be combined to create something similar to those comic strip syndicates uh, that had been around for about 20 years by this point, but instead a comic book syndicate, uh, a, a company in which material could be produced to then be sold to various uh, comic book publishers to provide content for their, for their comics. So Eisner had just had a fairly well-paying commercial art gig, so he had a little bit of money in his pocket. He provided 
the startup funds uh, and therefore got his name listed first in what would be known as the Eisner and Iger Studios. And the Eisner and Iger Studios at first consisted of Eisner and Iger, with Iger doing the sales, um, getting out there, you know, and making contacts, and Eisner creating all the content, both writing and drawing, and he did it under several different pen names so that they would give the impression they had a bunch of people working for them, see, so they could get, so they could get some contracts. By early 1939, though, they had, uh, they had made their mark, they were making inroads, and Eisner and Iger Studios, which was officially called Syndicated Features Corporation, had 15 employees, writers, artists, and letterers. It was no longer all Will Eisner. One of those employees was Bob Kane, who had been born Robert Kahn, and was uh, an old uh, friend of Will Eisner's from DeWitt Clinton High School. Um, after graduating from DeWitt Clinton, Robert Kahn had changed his name to Robert Kane to facilitate uh, being able to, uh, to get work uh, by appearing more mainstream and less, quote, ethnic and Jewish, because he was, like practically everyone else we're talking about here, the son of Jewish immigrants. Well, Cain had, uh, had, had worked uh, for National and Detective Comics. He'd actually done some stuff for more fun comics. Uh, he had done some stuff for Detective Comics and for Adventure Comics. He had worked on the short-lived Wow, What a Magazine with Jerry Iger. Word was out that um, Donenfeld and Leibowitz over at National were looking for another colorful superhero, though that word hadn't been invented yet, type character to cash in on the popularity of of Superman. And Kane had an idea, had an idea for a new character. He did not go through Eisner and Iger Studios. Uh, he directly contacted the editors over at uh, National slash DC because he didn't intend to uh, share his idea or the credit for it with somebody else. That idea was a colorful, acrobatic figure that Bob King called the Batman. <laughs> 